Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're happy that you've joined us, and we're gonna talk about plants. I'm looking around the table here. We're all ready to talk about plants. So give us a question. Call in and let us know what your questions are. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, so I can do cut flower questions and perennials. Who else is here? That is the question. And let's find out, and they're gonna tell you their expertise. Let's start first with you, Chuck Voigt. Good evening, Diane. Uh, I'm Chuck Voigt, and I was also in the Crop Sciences Department. I dealt mainly with uh, vegetables and herbs, mm -hmm. but you know, I had a good solid education here at the University of Illinois and Michigan State, so I can answer lots of things. But vegetables and herbs would be the thing that we would like to, to see happening. And we actually have uh, an herb question. It's about spearmint, and it says, can you give me some pointers on growing spearmint? Does it do well in our zone? <laughs> yes, spearmint is, is very vigorous in, in our zone. Uh, pretty much all of the, the true mentha mints are extremely invasive, in fact. Um, can grow out six to eight feet in all directions in one year. Um, so we usually would recommend that you try to grow uh, the mints in a, in a contained area, whether that's an area where you have like sidewalk bordering a house or, or maybe a flue tile that you bury or um, half barrel planters work pretty well for it, but you have to watch them because they will drop tendrils down and start to sneak off. Um, but generally speaking, spearmint, um, is a, a very vigorous plant and should do well for you. Um, moderate fertility, um, will stand a, a, a little bit of shade, uh, does fairly well in a moist but not waterlogged area, um, would be a pretty good bank cover if you had a, like a sh semi-shady area where you couldn't get anything else to grow. Uh, might do okay there, but you, know, you, you need to be able to keep it from going beyond that. Um, <clears throat> spearmint, per se is is a flavor and so there are a number of mints that have some version of the spearmint flavor um, one called improved spearmint or or kentucky kernel spearmint would be one that i've had and, and enjoyed it's a fairly true spearmint uh, flavor so uh, should not be not be too difficult i wouldn't recommend starting spearmint from seed because they vary and you really want to start with a good uh, clonal plant. So Chuck, you're not going to give the answer, plant it in the ground and then run? You're not going <laughs> to give that answer? It would literally take, it would beat you to the finish line, I think. Well, yeah, lots of, lots of backyard herb gardens, people who go out and, and buy a six pack, one each of six herbs, plant those somewhere in the backyard. No. Two years later, <laughs> the entire backyard is, is spearmint. Everything else has disappeared, but the spearmint has thrived. So people need to know that. Watch, yeah, con contain it. Watch out. It's a, it's a wonderful plant. You can use it in teas, you can use it in all kinds of things, but you can't use it as fast as it wants to grow, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Well, I enjoyed that answer, so I had to bring that out. Well, that was before the show started. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chuck. And now, Jennifer Nelson. Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Nelson. Uh, I'm a horticulturalist, and I write a blog at groundedandgrowing.co, so you can read my articles there. I have a couple of Facebook questions, and I the first question is, a uh, person writes, I want to fertilize my raised beds, but I don't know where to start. Is there something I can get at my local store? She has five four by eight beds. And then the other question is, when do you think is the optimal time to fertilize in the spring and how often thereafter? So gardening in raised beds is kind of like gardening in a giant container, really. And ideally, you're going to want to fertilize when you're planting in the spring. So for most of us, that means putting in something like a 12-12-12 or 10-10-10 balanced fertilizer. Uh, if you can find something that is a little more slower release, maybe an organic product that's not going to just be one big shot of all your nutrients, but it's going to dissipate over time, that would be better. 
most vegetables are going to appreciate having some sort of fertilizer applied monthly during the growing season. Uh, but if life gets to you, as it does to me sometimes, at least you did it when you planted it. Um, and if you uh, replant for a fall garden, I would go ahead and again do the, the balanced fertilizer. Uh, and at my house, I will hopefully be doing something this weekend with maybe get some lettuce going and I'll use some worm compost. So that's it. one option for fertilizing. If, you, if you've got it, use your compost. Yes, very good. Compost is really, imp that's really good stuff. If you have it, use that. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you, Jennifer. And now on to you, Bill Erickson. Yeah, thank you, Diane. Yeah, my name is Bill Erickson, and I'm a landscape architect with Prairie View Landscaping in Champaign. And uh, my specialty is, is basically residential landscape design, anything that has to do with the residential landscape, including water gardens. And tonight I've got a, a Facebook question as well. Uh, this is about a, a shady area. And um, Lori is asking, um, she says, I have a shady area along our driveway and the neighbor's fence I can get grass seed to grow, but then it dies even though I water it. Any suggestions? And um, you've, you've uh, probably heard the saying, it hurts when I do that. Well, don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, I would say forget the, the grass. You, you've got shade there and it, uh, very limiting conditions. So look at a better solution than grass. Uh, what I would recommend for uh, this area, first of all, is to widen the pavement a little bit so you can get out of the vehicle easier. Um, use uh, flagstone or blocks or something like that along the driveway and then start with a low ground cover that's shade tolerant uh, such as uh, a juga. Uh, a juga chocolate chip is a great one for, mm -hmm. for color contrast. And then behind that look at uh, shade perennials that are going to get a little bit taller uh, behind the fence and those could include Japanese forest grass. There's a nice one called all gold. Uh, which has a, a nice yellow variegation in the leaf. Uh, sweet woodruff would work. A uh, couple kinds of sedge, oak leaf sedge or ice dance would do well there in the shade. You will have to keep the area watered uh, to keep it healthy. And like we were talking about, compost is, is a very good uh, idea there for enriching the soil before you plant. Boy, those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. The flagstone is a, that, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think about it, but it makes right. it so easy. Yeah. Very good, thank you, Bill. That's always fun to look at landscape spots and come up with Creeping ideas. Creeping time comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah, sure. Creeping time. Very good. Fill in between the stones. You can yes. Mow, you could mow yeah. it just like grass. Yes. Yeah. yeah, if it gets overgrown, you mow yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Several of those are, are so hardy, they call them steppables. You mm -hmm. can actually walk mm -hmm. on them. I love that term. Yeah. Okay, so there's lots of ideas <laughs> right there. Well, let's go next to the Did You Know segment. You can hear the cicada song for up to a half a mile away, and they only sing during the daytime. The cicada makes the loudest sound of any insect. Let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to Joe's question about roses on line two. Hi there, Joe. Hello, I enjoy your program a whole lot. Thank My you. How much, how far down can you trim old fashioned roses. Okay, old fashioned roses. And yes. And do you not like the height of them? Is that what you're asking or just in general to keep them healthy? Well, just in general. To okay. Keep them healthy. All right. Like I see a lot of ponds well, like in the spring. I would wait until they start until they start right. sprouting. Yeah. Mhm. Mm well, and some of the old fashioned roses uh, kind of only bloom on old wood, mm -hmm. so you might want to wait till if, if, the, if it's a bloom, uh, one that blooms all at once and then is done for the year, I would wait till after it blooms and then, and then you know, kind of open it up and cut it back. Mm -hmm. Cause, because if you take them off early in the spring and you take it off the blossoms, so right. that was what I would worry about. On, on a lot of the old fashioned roses are just single bloom. Right, and then if there's anything <clears throat> dead, like you were alluding to, yeah. It would just be a little bit of a trim, mm -hmm. right? Just I'm to get the dead to, part to cut things back in right. the fall. I'm for fear of a bad yeah. winter. Now this winter's been mm -hmm. crazy mild, mm -hmm. but my yeah. luck, I would cut it back and the whole thing would die back. Yeah, because that they typically will. If you take it back too soon, they'll continue mm -hmm. to die back mm -hmm. from where you just right. cut it back. Yeah. 
There, there are some <coughs> great uh, old-fashioned roses. The uh, David Austin line is, is a wonderful oh, that's big. line of roses. So um, some of those are coming back into the landscapes, and, and several are very fragrant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we miss sometimes is the fragrance mm -hmm. is not in, in mm -hmm. some of the new roses, but boy, those right. David Austins are great. Right. And there's others, but that's a really good one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that rose question. That was a good one. Let's go, oh, it's a mint question. Let's go to Kathy's question about mint on line three. Hi, Kathy. I heard him talking, and I thought that it was really important that I ask this question. I have a mint arrow garden plant that I'm going to be repotting now, and it's, um, I'm going to put it under the, under the lights and keep it going. And it's, I would like to put it in the parkway. It'll have sun but it won't be horrid, you know, awful sun. Um, but it's kind of compacted soil. Is there anything that I need to do? Because I just want it to take over. Well, if you want it to take over, you might have chosen the right plant. <laughs> um, and the parkway it, is contained. If, oh, yeah. Yeah, it that's is. And, and, and that's nice to have concrete all the way around it. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're worried about the compaction and can do it, I would say... Uh, till it up or spade it up, do, get it worked up as much as you can, work in as much organic matter as you can, because once the mint takes over, uh, you're probably not going to have a, a huge chance to do that. I guess you could top dress with a little compost once in a while, but soil preparation would, you know, even though it, it grows like a weed, uh, if you're at all worried about the compaction factor, I would try to get it, get it prepared well before you put it in there so with organic matter and, and maybe a little, a little fertility, but Wait and see yeah, how, you much, how much fertility you need. <laughs> oh, can I ask one thing? Did I hear you right? Did you say that it was an arrow garden plant? Yes. Oh, yeah, so I, it's been growing in water all this time. Right. It needs to be, I know it needs to be hardened off. Yeah, yeah. I would put, yeah, I would put it in a pot for a while right. before you yeah. put it out. Right. Oh, I didn't hear that part. Yeah. Good job. Okay, well, hopefully that helps you. A parkway, that's the way to go if you've got one. All right, let's go to Rebecca's question about flowers on line four. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, enjoy your show so much. Thanks. Um, I, I'm a little concerned about this weather trend uh, that's going to be so nice and warm, but I'm afraid that my perennial's going to be popping up so uh, early, and um, I'm wanting to know what I can do to protect them. So I will listen to your answer on air, okay? Okay. Thank you. Bye. Good question. All right. Everyone can chime in if they want to. Well, don't go crazy uncovering no. things. No. Uh, even if they're turning kind of yellow and, mm -hmm. and looking kind of lang like they're languishing, you know, maybe if you've got leaves just matted in a huge thick, that you might want to thin that out. But uh, mm -hmm. if you get them out and encourage them to go ahead and grow, it's just, it's right. just pushing them further along. You know what I'm going to do with my perennials? Not a thing. Wait and see. I'm not going to do a thing. <laughs> Mother Nature has yeah. a way I have of them surviving. Yeah. I don't have leaves on them, you know. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Um, spring bulbs too. You'll, you'll see the leaves coming up, but usually those aren't flower buds, right. so exactly. they can they can get burnt and and die back quite a bit and not really get hurt. Right. So, but it is a good question, and a lot of people have been asking that. So it's good to know and not be overly concerned about it. Perennials are tough. They're used yeah. to, well, they're used to having some winter. But anyway, they're used to ups and downs of temperature. And the soil does moderate. I mean, it's not going to drop and get really high that far down very quick. Okay. Well, thank you for that question, Rebecca. Let's go to Dane's question on line five, and it's about trees. Hi, Dane. Hi. And what's your question? Well, I had a big gum tree out in the backyard, which is uh, probably about 18 by 18 square. And I have a nice porch out there. And we had the gum tree cut down this winter. And I'm wondering what do I do to plant something that's nice? Do you and want what, another what, tree? Yeah. Okay. And what should it be? Okay, so... Are you wanting a fast-growing tree? Uh, probably, yeah. Okay. You might want to look at some of the uh, hybrid elms. They're very fast growers, uh, and uh, the, the newer types are disease-resistant. There, there's several different varieties. Uh, Frontier elm actually has fall color. It has a maroon fall color, so that'd be a fast grower. But you'll want to get it uh, a, a good distance away from the house. 
uh, don't plant it, you know, within uh, eight feet or so. Get it out there at least 20 feet away. And then if you wanted something lower growing, I know you want shade, but I mean, there's, what's, what are some ideas that might be a slower growing one, maybe shorter, if you want to chip in on something like that. I was thinking, of, you know, there could be maples. Yeah. Right. Red um, maple, maybe. Right. Uh, a fast grower would be red bud if you want some, yes. some fast mm -hmm. shade out of a smaller tree. Um, but uh, some of the crab apples are very good mm -hmm. uh, with the smaller apples so that they're not a mess. Um, th those can be very good. Harvest gold is an excellent one. It really holds up in the heat of summer and the winds. I actually have a, a papal bark maple fairly close to my deck, and it, it does great. The leaves stay on well with orange fall color. Mm -hmm. And then just when I'm done uh, getting them off the porch, then they drop. But mm -hmm. still, it's a nice uh, smaller tree. Yeah, they take quite a while to get yeah. even medium sized. It's been 20 years, and it's yeah. just really, it's a two-story tree now. It's really nice, bigger mm -hmm. than the ones on campus, <coughs> and we have a lot of them on the U of I campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it may be like a hybrid maple, like an autumn blaze or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. The mm -hmm. Fermani yeah, Those are good, or Marmo is another yeah, good they have, hybrid yes. maple. Yeah, they have kind of the red maple color with uh, sugar, with this, excuse me, silver maple growth rate. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's a good idea too. Yeah. So there you go, we could talk trees the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, But those are a few good ideas. All right, let's go to Bill's question on line six <laughs> about mint. Hi, Bill. Well, hello, am I on? Yes, you are. Well, I've got a, a, about a 10 or a, a 15 foot by 20 foot area that's slightly sloping, maybe one inch and 12 inches on my in my backyard, surrounded by patio and and uh, flagstones, and I could never get anything to grow in there. I tried uh, sod that lasted about a year and a half or mm -hmm. two, and then I grass seed is hopeless. It's, it, now it's it's just always been mud. I was just wondering if I could use mint and uh, spearmint and then mow it. Because if that's so, you know, rugged, maybe it'll last. Yeah, mowing it might help spread, help establish it if you're getting more <laughs> bits you, of stem You want to be a, a little careful <laughs> with how you mow it, because if, you, if you're shooting it all around, it, it's not impossible that it could root in and, and grow somewhere else that you don't want it. Um, and you don't want to, it's not going to stand mowing at a turf level, but, you know, five or six inches, if you can do that, um, it's... it's it might stand up to three inches, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe something like, uh, oh, what's, uh, all I can think of is the... Uh, another ground cover? An another mint. Uh, the, the, well, I'm not gonna think of it, so it it's doesn't matter. It's not peppermint. There, there's it's sm not <clears throat> smaller ones. It's, <clears throat> no. It's not coming and we're not helping. I That's correct. I think once it Press got established on a slope, it would do a great job of holding the soil there. Abs oh, absolutely. The, the, the stems are all over and they're rooted in and it, it, it hangs onto yeah. soil mm -hmm. really well. So mm -hmm. I think you're on the right track as long as it's, it's, it can't get away and you right. know, take over the neighbor's yard or something. <laughs> and you might think about something that obstructs it from growing, if you, right. like a barrier, because it will. It will grow. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, that's something to think about, Bill. Thank you for your follow-up question on that. Well, let's go back and do some emails, and we're going to start first with you, Chuck. <laughs> okay. Uh, this person has a Carolina Reaper pepper plant that uh, they've grown in a two-gallon pot for three years. They keep it outside in the summer, bring it inside uh, uh, kind of late in the fall, and then take it back out in the spring. Uh, they'd like to transplant it into a five-gallon pot, and this was sent in December, and it's, should I do this now or wait till spring? And my answer would be wait till spring, because it's going to be under less than ideal conditions probably inside, unless you have uh, a greenhouse with supplemental lighting. Uh, so I would say just maintain it through the, through the rest of the winter. <coughs> And then as you get ready to take it outside, move it up into the five gallon pot. It's gonna get all that, that solar radiation and just gonna grow and the roots are gonna fill that, that new space and, and you should have uh, enough Carolina Reapers to, uh, to damage your whole neighborhood population. <laughs> <coughs> okay. <laughs> they scare me a little, I have yeah. to admit. <laughs> <coughs> all right, good job. And now, Jennifer. Okay, I have a question from a viewer. 
about their snake plant. They notice that one of their house plants looks like it's about to bloom. Uh, they've had it for years and they've never seen it happen before. They're not even sure of its official name. They call it a snake plant because of the stripes on the leaves. Oh, wow. And uh, they want to know if the blooming's unusual and how often and what's it actually called. Um, it is actually called snake plant. It's Sansevieria trifasciata, isn't it? Tri and uh, the blooming is not totally unusual. It happens when the plant is uh, root bound. And so that's a stress. Mm. And so you may see this little flower um, spike shoot up. And it smells really nice. So you, you'll wish mm. that it did it more often. Um, I had one that did it pretty well every year, every other year for a while. It had to get fairly big before um, it actually did it. Um, but it's something that's fun to, fun to talk about and uh, fun to say you had one that bloomed because not everybody has that experience. Yeah, I think I repot mine too much. Probably, I'm going to have yeah. to get them pot bound now. I want to yeah. see mine flower. Yeah, it, it well, and having it. them outside in, in the summer seems to help too mm. because they get all that I see. energy built up in them. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, that was very interesting. Thank you. And now, Bill. Okay. Uh, got a question about uh, sweet autumn clematis, and uh, Edwina is asking, uh, or, uh, she says, those who, uh, who know tell us that this is a sweet autumn clematis. I, I guess there's a picture coming up here. Um, the shape was not intentional, but looks like a baby elephant following <laughs> his mom. Oh, cute. Uh, comments and confirmation. Um, well, That's cute. Um, I agree with, with uh, what you see there. <laughs> uh, actually, though, I think what's happening, a sweet autumn clematis is a vine, and I'm guessing that that vine is growing over some existing shrubs. <laughs> and so that's why you're getting uh, the shapes there and uh, it will conform to whatever it grows on, whether it's a fence or a pergola. And it's a very aggressive vine. It can get about 30 feet in length, um, although you can cut it back to 12 inches and it will do very well. So you can control it uh, with aggressive pruning. It likes sun or partial shade, and um, it'll bloom late in the summer and early fall, and uh, hence the name and uh, it can recede, so you do have to watch a little bit for volunteer plants and, and scratch those out if they start uh, at the base of the plant. That is such a cute picture. Yeah, isn't I'm it? I'm glad yeah. you took I, care of that. I kind of thought it looked like a rubber ducky. But <laughs> yeah, I did too yeah. at first, but I can see <laughs> the other as well. Okay, let's go to uh, Gertrude's question about a gardenia on line three. Hello there. You've got uh, two gardenia plants. Uh, in the summer. Yes. And uh, I try to spray it and keep the leaves, not any, not any dust or anything on them. But the leaves started falling off, and the one, almost all of them have fallen off, and the other kind of come back some. How do you take care of them? I try not to keep them too wet. You know, I let them get almost dry before I put anything on them. And I, I use the uh, feed for the. Uh, that kind of plant it said on them, the America Vero. And I put some of those little stakes around it, but I think I've lost the one because the leaves, it just looks like sticks almost now. Is okay. there any way I can save those? Well, the, if the stems have got, uh, are not completely brittle and have some green to them, you might just hope to hang on until the spring and once the weather turns warm, I would uh, give them a nice dose of fertilizer and put them outside and keep my fingers crossed because I've never had good luck with gardenias over the winter inside. Well, it's and it's challenging. almost like a Benjamin fig when you move it or when you change mm -hmm. its location or when you bring it in from outside mm -hmm. its first reaction is drop to just everything. have a major leaf drop. So, mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it's dead. No. It doesn't necessarily mean it's dead. No. See if it breaks when you when you bend the, to bend the branches. If they've got, if they're pretty pliable, I think there's hope. And I think don't fertilize it you know, so if you're adding those right. stakes, I would not fertilize anymore because yeah. fertilizer says, hey, grow, and right. there's not good light unless right. you have a grow light set up, and it's, mm. I don't think it's necessarily worth it to have that. Yeah, save the fertilizer for when you put them outside. And then hopefully it, you can, yeah. it's like rosemary, you just try to get them through the winter. As, Come on. as close to dormant as you can, as you can hold them is yes. probably ideal. So cool, a little 
cooler and mm -hmm. as much light cooler as they can get, but no fertilizer at all. So you are not alone having trouble with gardenias. I think there are several people yeah. over the last couple months who've had issues with gardenias. So possibly move to Florida for this, the winter with your gardenia <laughs> and then come back. Be sure to come back though. So. <laughs> we don't it reminds me of Felder rushing in, in the garden in the back of his pickup <laughs> yeah. truck. Yeah. He drove around the country. He planted the back of his pickup truck and would drive around with his garden and, and it took the wind. It's really amazing. He came here in January and froze his rosemary though. Y yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> you so don't want to do that. Excuse to go buy more plants. Well, so there's that too. Good. Well, that is a possibility. <laughs> Well, we've had a nice <coughs> variety of questions. We want to thank our viewers. You folks are great. And I want to thank you three for being here and for your good expertise. We hope that you have a fun week gardening indoors or out. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>